now. Okay, so then that brings me to, um, I'm happy to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Her name is Christina Seely. Uh, just a little bit about her. She is a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes educator. She graduated from Brescia University in 2004 and completed her internship at Hamilton Health Sciences in 2005. She was a full-time clinical inpatient dietitian for Parkwood Institute Mental Health Care in London from 2006 until 2021. Uh, she covered all eight inpatient units, which is approximately 150 beds. She has been a diabetes educator at London Intercommunity Health Center since January 2022. Um, she was the 2017 recipient of a Professional Practice Award for Excellence in Innovation and Evidence-Based Care from St. Joseph's Healthcare and a recipient of the 2018 Leadership Award from Dietitians of Canada. Uh, she is also a contributing author to two Dietitians of Canada position papers. Uh, one is titled Promoting Mental Health Through Healthy Eating and Nutritional Care, and the other is Addressing Household Food Insecurity in Canada. And also, as a fun fact, she was interviewed for the spring 2017 issue of Chantelaine and for the December 2018 issue of Canadian Living. So thank you, Christina, for being here with us tonight, and uh, I know I'm really looking forward to listening in to your presentation. So you, you can so take much. it away. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for that lovely introduction. And Catherine, thank you for having me here tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here. My experience at Parkwood included working with two geriatric units, so people over the age of 65. And one unit was specialized for people with advanced dementia while we're experiencing responsive behavior. So that is where some of my knowledge for this presentation is coming from. And our other geriatric unit had a wide range of diagnoses, including some people living with mild to moderate stages of dementia. So I look forward to your questions throughout. Please pop them in the chat as, as they were saying. So just want to start with the land acknowledgement. London Inner Community, where I now work, is located on the traditional lands of the Anish Inabak, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Adawantarun, on lands connected with London Township and Songbird Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. I would also like to recognize the three First Nation communities neighboring the City of London, Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Munsee Delaware Nation. With this, I respect the long-standing relationships that Indigenous peoples have with this land as they are the original caretakers. So our objectives today that you would have seen on the website, review of healthy eating for older adults, relationship between nutrition, mental health, and well-being, how dementia can impact eating habits and nutrition, brainstorming ideas for supporting nutritional intake for someone living with dementia, and practical ideas and resources. This presentation was designed hopefully to be include interest um, for both the caregivers, so healthy eating ideas for yourself, and uh, also for the loved ones that you're supporting who are living with dementia. As we know, June is Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month, a very important awareness month. Dementia is the most significant cause of disability among Canadians aged 75 and older. It's estimated at this current time, there are over 5,000 Canadians living with dementia, 500,000. And this number is anticipated to virtually double by the year 2030. So we know that nutrition plays an important role in physical and mental health, but it is only one piece of the puzzle. There is many other factors such as sleep, activity, stress management, social supports, spirituality, and meaningful activity that also contribute to our physical and mental health. There's no one size fits all way to eat. So every time you hear nutrition information, you can take away what parts might be relevant for yourself. So that's just putting together the dimensions of wellness. There's many different pieces of it. So I like this picture because it just highlights how complex the way we eat is. There's so many factors that go into why people eat the way they do. Um, people's time factor for cooking and grocery shopping, their budget, which has become a really hot topic as the cost of food has been rising faster than ever. Um, the way people eat uh, with foods that have good memories and traditions for them culturally. Um, there's so many factors that impact the way we eat. It's part of celebration. So it's so much more than, than just nutrition. Many factors go into it. 
There are lots of benefits of nutrition for people of all ages, including older adults. So both improving and maintaining physical and mental health, supporting our energy level, food is definitely our fuel, helping to manage blood sugars, blood pressures, reduce the risk of heart disease, help prevent constipation, supports immune system. Nutrition was in the news a lot, such as vitamin D with uh, the pandemic lately, keeping bones and muscles strong to reduce the risk of falls, helping keep healthy skin intact. And we know for sure enjoyable meals enhance quality of life. It's something that we have to do three or four times a day every day, but it is also a very important part of quality of life. I'm just going to try to move my little bar here so I can see that at the top. There we are. All right, that's better. So common nutrition risk factors for seniors, it's going to vary widely um, by each individual, but um, there's a higher prevalence of decreased appetite potential for sensory changes. So decreased sense of taste or smell. People may find they you know, want to add a little more sugar or salt, for example, for food to taste good. Increasing number of medical conditions to manage. People can experience depression, loneliness, or social isolation. There can be changes in oral health, which impairs dentition or people's ability to swallow. Functional or cognitive changes can really impact people's ability to do all the food preparation and uh, you know, carry through with all the tasks that relate to eating. Increased prevalence of constipation, dehydration. As people need more medications, there can be more side effects to deal with. Cooking for one or two people can be a big change if people are used to cooking for more and eating well on a fixed income are a variety of challenges that people may face. For every age and stage, we know that nutritious, well-balanced meals support the health um, of everyone. The prevalence of malnutrition does increase with age. People living with cognitive changes don't need a special diet, but there can be a number of factors to consider, such as diet recommendations for other health conditions, people's changing preferences, and changes in the way people are eating. We know dementia can cause significant challenges with eating as it progresses, and we'll be exploring that tonight. A diet rich in healthy foods supports body and brain health. So just those kind of healthy foods that everyone thinks of, meat, fish, fruits and veggies, beans, chickpeas and lentils, whole grains, dairy products, nuts and seeds. You don't need to like all these types of foods, but these are some of the best known ones for health benefit. And this, here we go. We know as people get older, their nutrition needs change. So they need more protein rich foods, fiber rich foods, calcium rich foods, vitamin D, vitamin B12, and yet their calorie needs are going down. So it's harder to meet these increasing needs in a smaller amount of food, uh, generally around 25% less than when people are younger adults. It's generally recommend that people should liberalize their diet as needed to help maintain intake. So for example, the restrictions on sodium or sugar would then be lessened um, to focus on trying to get enough food to eat. Hey, Christina, um, sorry. Yeah. I just am not seeing your slides changing over the past couple of phrases. I'm just wondering if we should be oh. seeing different slides. Yeah, I wonder what's happened there. <laughs> I have changed them several times. Okay, I was wondering. So we're still see. seeing the common nutrition risk factors. Oh, okay. Let me see here if I can get it working again. Thank you for letting me know. No problem. Um, are you seeing nutrition for older adults now? We are, yeah. Do you want to do okay. a test change of slide? Yep. Yeah. Okay. That looks yeah, good. So that was the previous one that, that you would have missed. And then that one was missed too. Okay. Okay. There. Back okay. on track. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. I don't know what happened there. I, I didn't feel like I hit anything, but <laughs> okay. So we were just talking about that you can focus more on what foods and drinks are well accepted and enjoyed. Meals or snacks offered at regular times can help to capture the times when people are more hungry, and that can fluctuate throughout the day, day by day. People often change to fewer meals and smaller portions as they get older. Restrictive weight loss diets are not recommended for this group as they may, prevent, they may present risks in older adults, including muscle and bone loss and increased risk of falls and fractures. Protein needs for older adults. The recommendation for, for younger adults is around 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram. 
For adults over 65 years, it's closer to one gram protein per kilogram. So for example, a 200 pound person would need about 91 grams of protein. To figure out the pounds to kilos is just to divide it by 2.2. And then approximately you get the grams of protein. Some people say just half your, your weight in pounds, that gives you approximately how much protein you need. So having high protein foods at each meal is going to help the body use the protein more effectively than having most of the protein intake at dinner. In North America, sometimes we have really small breakfasts and lunches and then a really big dinner, but having meals that are more equal in size when it comes to protein is actually going to help the body use it more effectively. So here's a sample menu just to show what can it look like trying to get, you know, sort of that 90 gram of protein for a 200 um, pound person. So this is just showing how things can add up with foods like dairy products, you know, eggs. Um, in terms of the oatmeal shown there, the high protein instant oatmeal, six grams of protein, the regular instant oatmeal is about three grams. So even grain products, uh, as you'll see the two slices of bread, regular grain products will have some protein in them. You can find higher protein bread as well. Um, so a little bit of deli turkey meat, um, add some more protein, a glass of milk again. And you can see like a um, three ounce serving of fish, which is only about the size of a deck of cards, 20 grams of protein from that. Um, and then uh, something like macaroni, um, pasta has some um, protein as well, cheese and cracker snack, and you're over 90 grams. And obviously this is for people who are eating, you know, kind of three regular meals a day. Um, people may be eating a lot less than that. And, and that's where challenges in trying to get your protein intake comes in. Um, so we're talking about an optimal protein intake of one gram per kilogram. Um, if people meet even half their needs, that's going to be still very helpful compared to, um, you know, if they're not having much protein at all. So every bit helps. It doesn't have to be uh, the optimal range. And here's just a sample list of foods high in protein. So you can see um, some of the higher ones there. Of course, everyone thinks right away of uh, meat, beef, pork, fish, or poultry. Um, but there's other sources as well, some of the vegetarian ones, if people eat tofu, um, eggs, of course, as we mentioned, cheese, um, that ensure would be one of the lower um, protein ensures. We'll have some of the higher ones featured later in the presentation. Um, soy milk um, is similar in protein to um, the cow milk, the dairy milk, so it's a higher protein plant-based beverage white milk or chocolate milk. Um, so Greek yogurt is always gonna have twice the protein of the regular yogurts. Um, people can eat what they enjoy there out of the yogurt range. Each one will have different benefits. Uh, nut butters or spreads, you need kind of a full two tablespoon serving to get that much protein from peanut butter. Many people would use probably less than that, but uh, it's still a good source of protein. A little bit of nuts and seeds, you only need a quarter cup at a time for that much protein uh, to get the health benefits from it. Beans, peas, or lentils are excellent for protein. You can see there, three quarters of a cup will provide you with 12 grams. As we were saying, some of the grain products just have a bit of protein in them. Uh, fruit and veggies are, are gonna be low protein. And one way to add more protein is to mix skim milk powder into things. That's often the base of a lot of the more expensive protein powders. And cottage cheese is a really outstanding source of protein. You can also get flavored smooth ones like in vanilla, lemon, or um, there's a couple other flavors. I think there's um, salted caramel, um, which tastes, you know, that gets rid of that kind of lumpy texture. You know, a lot of people don't like that and it's really good for protein. So those are a few ideas there. So I'm gonna try to get the screen here we go. So uh, a lot of dietitians think of planning meals as just sort of mixing and matching the food group. So here we have a grain product, dairy product, and a fruit. Um, or thinking of a meal sort of in a divided plate, some kind of vegetable, it could be any kind, you know, a softer cooked or salad, uh, and any kind of fruit. Um, it's showing a tuna sandwich with a melt here. And dinner, just again, showing a quarter of the plate, you know, something with protein, something for carbohydrates, could be potato, rice, pasta, buns, that kind of thing, and showing vegetables uh, with a little dessert there. For older adults, some people have proposed that the plate should look more like a third, a third, a third to give a bigger protein serving. 
So fluid needs is a really important topic for older adults. Um, the minimum fluid needs for seniors is estimated at one and a half liters a day. A lot of long-term care homes use that as sort of a, a, a minimum baseline, but the optimal amount is actually the same as for adults, about 2.2 liters for women and three liters for men. All beverages count towards fluid intake, um, except for alcohol. And having beverages throughout the day, kind of at all meals and snacks is really important to help meet people's needs. But we know older adults um, are considerably higher risk for dehydration than younger adults, um, especially in the 80s and 90s generally. So risk factors include decreased sense of thirst. So people will no longer feel thirsty as often or as um, intensely. Cognitive impairment, um, especially if people um, are no longer vocal, um, or no longer speaking, it can be uh, harder for them also to cue for drinks or, or um, let their caregiver know. Um, limited access to fluid, use of laxatives or diuretics can cause increased fluid losses. Urinary incontinence, um, people sometimes will drink less because they don't want to be experiencing that. Um, diminished kidney function. Um, and any desire to limit bathroom trips. So um, some people will say, you know, I don't drink after like four o'clock, you know, to make sure I'm not up several times at night to the bathroom, but it limits the window where they're going to get their drinks in. So symptoms of dehydration can include um, at the more severe levels, electrolyte disturbances, changes in how drugs are, are working in the body, um, headaches, confusion, constipation, concentrated urine, like that darker color or stronger smelling, reduced urine output and swollen or dry tongue. Some people will get papery skin as well over time. So um, we're over half water is by far the most essential nutrient that we have to have on a daily basis. So it just, um, it's involved basically head to toe, every part of the body, as you can see in this little diagram here. Um, with blood flow, um, blood being 83% water, um, that's why, you know, good hydration is um, a big factor in maintaining normal blood pressure as well. So lots of benefits for being well hydrated, reduced risk of urinary tract infections because you're flushing out that area more consistently, uh, reduced risk of kidney stones, helps with constipation, um, it can help maintain normal blood pressure, and with brain functioning as well, um, we need a, a strong normal blood flow to the brain for all of its functions. So Mild dehydration can impact lightheadedness, dizziness, uh, headaches, tiredness, reduced alertness, and difficulty concentrating. And it also helps decrease the risk of pressure ulcers. Um, if people get that dry, papery skin, it's a lot more likely, unfortunately, to suffer tears or injuries or pressure ulcers and break down. So um, yeah, that's uh, uh, lots of reasons to, to keep the fluids up, especially where the, the warmer months are coming. So this is just talking about like vitamin supplements. So where possible, it is recommended to try to obtain your nutrients from food. However, there's some that are, are hard to get enough, um, such as vitamin D. It's inadequate in the diet. The average Canadian gets only around 200 international units a day from their diet. So we know that taking 1,000 international units, vitamin D per day, reduces falls in the studies by about 20%, helps reduce tooth loss, uh, low vitamin D levels are also linked to depression. Uh, we don't know for sure if it's cause and effect, but that has been a trend pretty consistently in the research. There are receptors for vitamin D throughout the body, and it is very important to try to prevent deficiencies. But Canadians are prone to deficiencies unless they're taking a supplement, because we can only make it from the sun for about 25% of the year. And vitamin B12 is one of the um, vitamins that can become low for older adults. It's more difficult to absorb it from food because there tends to be less stomach acid um, as you get older and stomach acid is needed to break the vitamin B12 into its more absorbable form. So about 10 to 30% of older adults will require supplements to maintain normal vitamin B12 levels. And you may have heard that B vitamins are often linked to different aspects of cognitive function. So it's good to try to prevent deficiencies. So um, sometimes um, iron deficiencies can occur, um, especially if people are, you know, having blood loss or, or just poor intake, things like that. So if that's found, that's when they would recommend taking a supplement. So omega-3 is one of the more popular supplements nowadays. So a lot of interesting research has been happening. 
Um, some studies have found a lower risk of cardiovascular health issues. Um, some have found lower risk of depression with certain um, intake amounts. However, eating fish continues to be found to be superior to supplements and still uh, the top way to get your omega-3s um, from diet would be to be eat seafood. Uh, if people don't eat seafood, then definitely the supplements would be something to consider. Uh, for multivitamin, it can be helpful to take an age and gender specific multivitamin from any of like the, the bigger brand names such as Centrum, a One a Day, those kind of brands. Um, it can help to fill the gap, especially if people's intake is, is dropping um, to help prevent deficiencies. And so for protein, uh, as we were saying, um, things like Ensure protein powder, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but uh, sometimes it, it, they can be helpful to close gaps um, from what people are able to eat. So just to um, quickly, um, general healthy eating information. Um, so the food guide was updated two years ago from that big fold out that we all were familiar with from the 10 years prior. And I just put it down to this little snapshot showing the divided plate with a couple of things on the back about, you know, on just general healthy eating principles, you know, cooking at home, eating with others and using food labels and things like that. They did clearly say this time making water your drink of choice. However, as we'll get into, you know, if you People are struggling to get enough nutrition. Sometimes having nutritious drinks is going to be more helpful than just water. So this guide is more designed for kind of a general population tool. So seafood, um, every time you read about brain health and, and uh, food, seafood is going to be the number one thing that comes up as a brain food. It's just packed with the omega-3 fatty acids that we have to get from diet and have so many important roles in the brain, uh, zinc, iron, vitamin B12. Um, so really vital for brain development and function. Um, Omega-3s are really important for, for kids as well when their brains are forming. Um, they have found in studies that low levels of omega-3 may actually speed up brain aging and contribute to deficits in brain functioning. Uh, the studies are showing that once people have Alzheimer's diagnoses, that fish oil is um, unable to improve brain functioning at that point. It's more looking at people with mild cognitive impairment or um, before cognitive impairment happens that there may be benefit. Um, so there's just a little bit of information about that there. And it is recommended to check in with a doctor before starting um, a fish oil supplement if uh, people are considering it. So excellent sources include salmon, sardines, mackerel, herring, some of those fattier fish, uh, but all seafood will be um, at least a good source of omega-3, uh, including canned tuna, which is a little bit more affordable, um, more convenient. So there's a couple of handouts there if anybody wants to look at the online information. So a question that comes up a lot when I'm talking about seafood is people want to know, but is there a mercury concern? Um, and the, the verdict from Health Canada is that most Canadians don't need to be concerned about mercury exposure as a result of fish consumption. It's really only those very large feeder fish that have eaten a lot of smaller fish that tend to have the higher levels, um, but people don't generally eat, you know, um, shark, swordfish, marlin, and orange roughy, that these kinds of uh, big feeder fish are not common for us. Um, most canned tuna is safe, so canned tuna is going to be different in the level than, than the fresh or frozen tuna. Um, the only restriction they do suggest is that the canned albacore or white tuna should be limited to two cans per week. And again, most people would never exceed that. Canned light or skipjack tuna is low mercury. Um, sustainably sourced fish, if that matters to people, is now being identified on the packages more often by that symbol. So in general, the health benefits of consuming seafood far outweigh any risks of mercury intake. So for whole grains, you may see the little whole grain council label on foods. Um, a lot of interesting research coming out about the benefit of whole grains. Um, so the average intake is fairly high for people, around 25 grams for women, uh, 38 grams for men is what's recommended, but Canadians only get around 14 grams per day on average. So a large review that was published in The Lancet suggested that high fiber eaters have a 15 to 30% lower risk of heart attack, stroke, type two diabetes and colorectal cancer. Whole grains can include brown rice, whole grain pastas, oatmeal, whole grain breads, barley, quinoa, et cetera. So there are quite a few different types of whole grain products to choose from. 
and fiber. So when I worked in the hospital, I would say um, increasing fiber intake was one of the more common referrals that I was getting. A lot of people were having challenges in this area. Um, so uh, regularity is a really important part for quality of life and to help maintain people's appetite and keep people feeling comfortable. So I really believe this part is very important to keep a close eye on for, for people's comfort. Um, so not only does high fiber intake help with constipation, but it also helps to carry out the bad cholesterol out of the body and helps maintain the strength of the bowel wall. Uh, so just some examples that people can incorporate in their diet. Old Brand Buds is a really great product if people like it. Um, so it has those crunchy little buds that you can add to yogurt or other types of cereal, things like that. Um, it has two types of fiber in it and just a quarter cup to a third of a cup can make a really big difference in people's fiber intake and regularity. Um, prune juice or dried prunes have natural laxative effect. Uh, wheat bran um, is something soft, you know, that wouldn't add that crunchy factor. So you can sprinkle it into a lot of different things. A small amount is pretty high in fiber. Uh, the high fiber cereals usually have between three to five grams per serving, such as shredded wheat, shreddies, fiber one and wheat abix. High fiber fruits and veggies, such as apples and pears, you know, berries, things with the skin on them. It's going to be good for fiber. Beans, chickpeas, and lentils are loaded with fiber, and nuts and seeds are great as well. So beans are, if, um, if people like beans and can tolerate them, um, they're, they're lower in cost, they're good sources of protein and potassium, and excellent sources of fiber. So having beans occasionally can really help with regularity. Um, they can be mixed into different salads. I think um, like a bean salad, a uh, three bean salad, that kind of thing is popular in the summers, especially. They can be added to pastas or into rice dishes. There's a lot of great recipes at that Bean Institute website that I have listed there. So a three quarters cup of beans is a serving of, it's a meat alternate for protein. Um, and it just lists that they also help to regulate blood sugar as well. So sometimes people wonder, you know, should I be eating fruit or veggies? You know, which one is better? Um, a lot of the studies are kind of showing kind of an ideal ratio of sort of two fruits a day and maybe three vegetable servings a day. And again, this is sort of an optimal amount. Most people probably eat around two to three a day, which is still much better than, than having no fruit or veggies. Um, we know that higher intakes of produce helps to um, potentially slow the rate of cognitive decline, can help with healthy blood pressure, all that potassium coming in is good for blood pressure, can help lower the risk of heart disease, stroke, and certain types of cancer. So these are really powerhouses for, you know, the antioxidants, the vitamins, things like that. Um, so that if people do enjoy fruits and veggies, it's great to have a few a day if you can. Um, we know that leafy green vegetables, um, they have certain components called protonoids associated with slowing down the brain aging and helping support our immune function. Um, and cruciferous veggies, I think people often hear about broccoli, cauliflower, you know, Brussels sprouts, those kinds of things. Um, they have some unique components that have anti-cancer -can chemicals in them as well. There's an article listed there that has more information of uh, some, sort of the special things and different types of vegetables and fruits. In general, each color group is going to have different health benefits. So sometimes people wonder, like, can I include processed foods in a healthy dietary lifestyle? And absolutely, there's more healthier choices in the, you know, those middle aisles than ever before. So. Um, canned fruits or vegetables, dried foods such as um, beans and peas and things and pastas, frozen foods. There's amazing selection now of frozen fruits and veggies. They're just as nutritious as fresh because they've been frozen right at the peak of freshness when they've been picked. Um, so they haven't been transported across the, you know, the world deteriorating like some of our fresh produce is. Um, so people can definitely have a range of fresh frozen or can for their produce and ready to eat items. Uh, we have an amazing selection now people can afford them you know everything from the salads and the fruits and um, side dishes that are ready to go um, meat items that are ready to go now in stores like uh, Loblaws and Superstore so um, all these things might be considered you know convenience or a bit processed but uh, all, all great choices um, so it's nice to have options because um, cooking from scratch is not something that uh, most people have um, enough time you know and energy to do every day day after day. So this is going to be a quick summary of two eating patterns that are been associated with helping to support mental health. 
So the brain is absolutely amazing. You know, the, the functions that it does, it's more powerful than the best computers that they've been able to develop. So, so with all that work that it does, it has the hungriest cells in the body. It's only 2% of the body's weight, but it's using 20% of all the food energy. One quarter of every pump of blood goes to the brain and the nutrients are all working together to help protect and repair the brain. So um, a lot of the information that the Alzheimer's Society puts out is just if people are interested in sort of the lifestyle things that can help support their brain health, uh, what's good for the heart is good for your brain, you'll hear. So any heart healthy things um, will help the brain as well. So being active, having the healthy diet, challenging your brain, keeping yourself stimulated with new activities and enjoying social activity. The two patterns of eating that focus on foods high in the brain essential nutrients are the Mediterranean and mind diets. Um, so for you caregivers, you know, these foods help support your overall health and may help with mood and slowing aging of the brain. These eating patterns have benefits as well for people with mild cognitive impairment, and they're often recommended by Parkwood's Aging Brain Clinic. I know Dr. Bori there is a big fan of the style of eating, and he frequently mentions it to his clients. So the Mediterranean diet, uh, there's many healthy ways to eat. As we were saying, it's not one size fits all, but the largest volume of research showing benefits of diet is behind the Mediterranean diet. So um, pretty amazing things linked to it, up to 30% fewer cardiovascular events, helps reduce the risk of developing diabetes, the prevalence and severity of depression. And if people follow it over their lifetime, it's linked to a lower risk, up to a third of developing Alzheimer's. And it's ranked as one of the more enjoyable and easier to sustain eating patterns compared to many of the other diets that are out there. So it focuses on plenty of fruits, veggies, whole grains. Um, it does include potatoes and some beans, nuts and seeds. Olive oil is used pretty regularly as a fat source uh, for cooking and salads and things like that. Uh, dairy products, eggs, fish and poultry in low to moderate amounts. So now I'm going to talk about the MIND diet. It's a subset of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, which was originally developed for hypertension. And it was created by Harvard University in the States. And it, it's a summary of antioxidant rich and anti-inflammatory foods to help protect the brain. And I'm just going to um, highlight the benefits of that is um, they found in this big group of people when they followed their diets over a number of years, um, those whose diets most closely reflected the MIND diets reduced the risk of developing Alzheimer's by 35% when followed moderately and up to 53% lower incidence when they controlled for other factors when followed closely, which, which is quite, quite amazing. So it's just a, a more simple way of looking at things with 10 brain healthy foods, green leafy vegetables, other vegetables, berries, nuts, beans, whole grains, fish, poultry, olive oil, and it does include wine. Um, that's usually a small glass of red wine with, with dinner. And then five foods to limit or eat less often. They had butter, whole fat cheese, fried fast foods, bread meat, and pastries and sweets. And then they just, the, the way they figured out who was following the diet the closest, um, they just gave people a score. Um, for three servings of whole grains, two servings of vegetables a day, small glass of wine, leafy greens at least six times per week. That's something more like Italians would do, for example, but uh, some cultures do eat that much salad um, or use leafy greens that often. Nuts at least five times a week. That would be a small quarter cup serving, a bean serving four times a week. Berries twice a week. It was the one fruit that they, they highlighted for brain health. Um, poultry twice a week, fish once a week, and olive oil as the main oil. So with, they did another run of um, data on um, the test results, and they found that those that followed the MIND diet the closest, um, it was linked with their brain um, on, on a whole host of cognitive tests, that they had younger brains by seven and a half years. So, uh, so they concluded that it was helping to slow the aging of the brain. So the MIND diet is nice in that it is actually simpler to follow than the Mediterranean style. Um, it doesn't have as many foods listed. Um, and as like I said, just sort of the 10 kind of eat more often and five eat less often. This is just showing a sample day, for example, having like a whole grain of oatmeal with a sprinkle of nuts and berries, a lunch with a whole grain tuna wrap, 
with some type of vegetable. Um, so either salad, cooked veggies or vegetable soup, baked chicken with three bean salad. Um, you can see more examples of other days if you'd like at the link below. And now on to dementia nutrition, which I think is probably the top area of interest for tonight after we've done sort of the introductory section. We know um, this is a quote from Alzheimer's Society. Uh, when caring for someone with dementia, meal times can become stressful and frustrating. The caregiver has a lot to consider, making sure that the person with dementia eats a well balanced diet and is properly hydrated, but also ensuring that meal times are an experience associated with pleasure and enjoyment. And I'm sure some of you could relate to that quote, some aspects of it. So there can be um, very significant changes. Now, everyone's journey is unique and different, but um, these are some things that can start to occur as people's um, cogn cognition changes. They may have taste and smell changes. Um, people's preferences can change fairly dramatically. I had um, some individuals that I worked with, you know, the families were saying, oh, they never used to like those kinds of things, or, you know, I'm surprised what they're eating nowadays. So sometimes it can change quite a bit. Um, they may prefer sweet foods or certain parts of the meal. Appetite can go up or down. Um, the general trend is, is usually lower over time, but uh, some people it will go up and down. They may forget, you know, what things are or what they're used for. So they may not remember, you know, how to use the utensils anymore or what different types of food are. They may not be familiar with them anymore. They may have a hard time making decisions. So if you think of meal time, there can be a lot of decisions. You know, what am I going to eat now? Well, it's size of bite. When am I going to have my drink? And sometimes it can be overwhelming for people if they're having trouble making decisions. They may lose the ability to feed themselves independently um, if they don't remember, say, you know, how to feed themselves or their hand-eye coordination starts to change. Um, it can become more uh, frustrating or challenging trying to feed themselves. Um, they may no longer be able to cut up their food independently. Then they may develop chewing or swallowing problems. Um, they may not be chewing food fully or adequately um, or have trouble swallowing properly. They may have challenging mealtime behaviors, such as spitting, pocketing food in cheeks, turning head away, wandering away from the table. So these things can be quite challenging potentially for their caregivers. In terms of helping people with dementia eat, and again, I look forward to hearing from those on, on this call today, you know, for, for more ideas. So these are just some brainstorming. Offer familiar or preferred foods, which can definitely change over time. And you can keep all caregivers updated when you discover new preferences or changing preferences. Small frequent meals can be helpful if a person is restless or has a low appetite. Extra time to eat. People with dementia frequently eat at a slower pace, can take up to an hour per meal. I know at our hospital site um, on, our, on our one unit, you know, they would budget, you know, the full hour, like staff would be dedicated to just for feeding so it wouldn't be rushed. Um, offering one item at a time can help people sometimes to focus on, you know, just the one, eating the one thing at a time, less decisions to make with one utensil, keeping the eating area clear, using a simple placemat to contrast with the plate or a colored plate sometimes helps people. Um, if the plate is slipping around, you can put a wet washcloth under the plate, that kind of thing. Um, turning off the TV because that can be a source of distraction. Some people may find that having peaceful music playing may add to the meal experience. Um, and some, some people may find that distraction, but it's worth experimenting with. Dental care, if possible, you know, if you're able to help your loved one maintain their dental checkups, um, because we know cavities, mouth sores, or poor fitting dentures can greatly impact eating. And if people aren't able to maintain the same standard of oral care, they're at higher risk of developing those types of issues. Um, they may not be willing to wear their dentures anymore. That can be another challenge. Um, eating with a person with dementia, um, this can help them copy um, what, what you're doing. It can help make the meal time more pleasant. Food can be described in a positive way while eating together. If you're feeding your loved one, you may, you know, you may not be able to eat at the same time, but if they're, if they're still feeding themselves, then um, eating together can be very pleasant. Um, you can try hand over hand if they're starting to lose their ability to feed themselves. So um, most people seem to prefer right, maintaining their independence as much as possible. Um, so you just provide whatever guidance kind of at the lower level that they need to get going. 
uh, finger food. So if people are having trouble using utensils, sometimes having a finger food option can help with independence. What we would do sometimes is just include a sandwich or a half sandwich, um, you know, with the hot meal. So that depending on how the person was doing, you know, they would have something that they could feed themselves more readily with using their hands. So other than sandwiches, you know, there can be hard boiled eggs, cheese or meat slices, cut up, you know, um, fruit or vegetables that are firm enough to hold in the hand, chicken fingers or fish sticks, muffins, toast, waffles. And uh, in the resources that you've received, there is a finger food ideas handout for additional suggestions if anyone's interested. There's a whole bunch of feeding aids on the market. These are just a few. Um, if you have utensils with the built up grip, uh, it can be easier for people to feed themselves. There's also ones that are angled that can be easier to use uh, or fork with a hand strap. So you don't need that kind of tight grip. The nosy cups help people um, to have to drink without the, the edge of the, the cup hitting their nose. There's also cups available that have a lid on them um, with a spout. Um, so if people are at risk of spilling their hot drink on themselves or things like that, um, we had some clients have some success having those types of um, cups with the, the spout on it so they could still drink and not uh, spill. Um, like if people have tremors or things like that or they're, they're unsteady with their hands. The plate guard, so that's kind of a lip plate. Um, if it's built up, it can be easier for people to feed themselves without spilling. So um, in the community, you can access you know, referrals to occupational therapy um, or speech language pathology, and both can help people um, to source these types of products. There are catalogs and things online that um, both of those professions would be able to help with. Sometimes giving people directions about what to do. Um, so on the Alzheimer's Society um, website, they have some examples just clearly telling people like, you know, to pick up the spoon, you know, to take a small scoop of something, you know, bring it up to your mouth and swallow and kind of just giving a play by play direction. Some people can follow that if they're, they're starting to lose their ability to remember what to do. If people aren't opening their mouth and you're trying to feed them, sometimes gently stroking the cheek or jaw can help them to open their mouth or using a, a chilled spoon on their lips sometimes can cue them to open. Uh, it's always important to check to make sure that the previous bite was swallowed fully so you can watch their throat to see was there a good swallow. Try to get, get a little peek inside as you're coming in with the next bite because um, sometimes people can build up a lot of food in their mouths and not, not be swallowing it fully. Sips of fluid in between the solids can help people to clear down the residue. And again, you can cue the person, you know, to please swallow that down, make sure that it's gone. Um, it's important to only feed when alert. Sometimes people uh, who have more advanced dementia can have times where they're a little bit more drowsy or sleepy during the day. Um, so in our hospital, they would generally like reapproach at different times. Um, if someone was too sleepy, you know, they would try to save the train um, to reapproach maybe later on, um, things like that, or um, offer other foods, you know, um, such as snacks or things when they were more alert. Um, and it's really important to have the person in an upright position um, that really helps keep the airway protected. If people are sitting upright and their head is perpendicular to the ground or in a slight chin tuck position, if their head is pointing backwards at all, you can uh, really increase the risk of uh, food going down the wrong pipe into the airway. So I've included in the resource package um, a handout that has a lot more details about feeding people, uh, including pictures of um, positioning people if, if anybody's interested. So some of the other safety strategies include making sure that people are upright for 30 minutes following all meals. This allows more time for food residue to clear the airway, so around the pharynx area, um, to make sure that it won't go down the wrong pipe once they lie down. Um, feeding with smaller spoons can help to make the bite size more manageable for people, so teaspoons over tablespoons. Alternating bites of food on slips of fluid to make sure that food is going clearing out of the oral cavity um, so that people aren't pocketing food, hopefully, in their cheeks. And uh, oral hygiene, wherever possible, does help decrease the risk of aspirating food residue. Um, so a clean mouth, you know, if someone um, has, say, their saliva go down the airway, um, that's less likely to cause pneumonia or an infection um, if there isn't a lot of food residue in the mouth. And um, caring for people's teeth um, or just you know, oral health in general can become pretty challenging if people are, um, are living with advanced dementia. And there are videos online that, um, that you can search on YouTube or whatnot that will help provide some more ideas for trying to maintain people's oral hygiene. 
So one of the, the most common challenges that, that I was often being consulted with is um, people's intake going down as their dementia was progressing. Um, there are some cases where people may eat more with some types of dementia, such as some of the frontal temporal dementias um, are more common with, with people eating more. And there are some strategies for that in the one handout that was um, attached. And we can certainly talk about that in the chat after if anyone has a loved one who's eating more than usual. But I, I'm focusing on eating less just because it is the more common um, thing that people tend to experience. So it is important to double check um, with a doctor if there may be any underlying treatable causes for the, the decreased intake or loss of appetite. So checking is there any underlying illness or infection such as a urinary tract infection, which can be relatively common. Is the person experiencing any pain in the oral cavity or physically? If someone's in pain physically, they often don't feel like eating, as you can imagine. Um, so sometimes a bit of pain management can, can be helpful with Tylenol or whatnot. Um, if someone is experiencing depression, like if they're, you know, their affect is becoming really flat and they seem more withdrawn and, you know, other signs of depression um, can be treated often with medication to improve that. If people are, are tired a lot of the time, Sometimes the medications can be changed around, you know, there may be ones that are, you know, causing the person to be more tired. Um, sometimes the timing of the medications can be changed. Um, so fatigue, also they sometimes look for other underlying issues like, you know, deficiencies that could be contributing to the tiredness. Um, and medication changes, as I was saying, can just help to stimulate people's appetite or increase alertness. So some medications have a side effect of increasing appetite, and sometimes doctors will adjust the medications to help provide that side effect, uh, which could be desirable if people are eating as well. And then just care planning was, was happening at the hospital. You know, if someone has um, agitation or responsive behaviors that are interfering, you know, with intake at mealtime or making mealtimes, you know, not, not enjoyable for people, um, sometimes there can be just different strategies for you know, timing of feeding, you know, the approach that the caregivers are taking, um, what medications are being used, and just trying to figure out if there's ways to help the person. So high protein or high calorie options. If someone's eating less, you wanna to try to make what they do have count, um, you know, to be nutrient dense. So if someone loses 5% or more of their weight um, within a month or two um, or over a longer period, that can be a flag that, you know, their nutrition intake is deteriorating um, or you're noticing they're eating significantly less than usual. Um, sometimes just trying to focus on some of these higher calorie options can help. So having uh, milk products are very nutrient dense, um, could be like the higher fat yogurts or yogurt drinks, eggs, avocado and cheese are all great choices. Um, so the, like these um, bread products here that are listed can be higher calorie ones. Um, sometimes you can add you know, a little bit of you know, margarine or butter or whatever, um, a little bit of peanut butter. If people don't have any swallowing issues, um, making your own smoothies. Um, the nutrition supplement drinks like Ensure and Boost or ice cream. So just to touch on the, some of the supplements that are available. So yeah, on, on, the, on the unit when I was working there, uh, we did use Ensure, you know, one or two a day, like was the most common, you know, uh, for a lot of people. Sometimes people end up drinking a lot better than they eat the solid food. And people can definitely live on Ensure. I know it's not as ideal as people being able to eat, you know, those balanced regular meals, but we had some individuals with us for years who that was like, you know, more than half of their intake. And they may Maintained, like all the signs of being, you know, well nourished, um, you know, maintaining their muscle mass and their strength and, and their skin and everything. So these can these can work, they can help for people when when everything else isn't working, you know, because um, the sweet taste buds tend to be the last ones to be affected. And a lot of people like to have a cold sweet drink. Um, so these Ensure products can be fairly well accepted. So just some examples of what you can find at the drugstore. Um, any of these can be ordered in as well if a drugstore doesn't care certain ones. The Ensure Protein Max is one of their newer products. It's their highest protein. It is a little bit of a heavier consistency because it has so much into it. So sometimes people will mix it with, with milk or, you know, put it on ice or things like that um, to make it less heavy, but it is pretty packed with calories and protein. Ensure Plus has been around a long time. You can see similar calories with, with less protein, uh, but still a good amount of protein. 
ensure high protein is around 12 grams of protein and a lower calorie. Sometimes people are looking for the protein, but, but don't need as much calories. Um, ensure compact. This one has been like a more senior friendly um, addition to the lineup a few years ago. It's a half size bottle at 118 mils and it has nine grams of protein. So it is, it is close to the nutrition of ensure high protein, basically with half the water. And then Glucerna was made specialty for people with diabetes. And you can see some of the factors there. It's lower in sugar and it has some more fiber in it to help with the blood sugar response. So in terms of swallowing problems, so they can occur from the cognitive changes, um, particularly in more moderate to severe dementia, or say if someone's had a stroke or something like that, that's affecting the muscle control. Um, swallowing issues can occur if someone is more fatigued, um, you know, and is having trouble being, being alert to swallow properly. Um, so the goals may include increase, decreasing the risk of um, aspiration, so food going down into the lungs, um, trying to maintain people's nutrition and considering quality of life. Strategies may include adjusting diet texture. Um, we had several types such as uh, diced, minced, uh, and pureed at the hospital, which um, the speech language pathologist would help to uh, determine what, you know, what texture might be helpful for people. Thicken fluids, if someone is having a lot of trouble with fluids, it gives more time to swallow the thicker liquid and it's easier to control. Adjustments to how people are seated or positioned um, using adaptive equipment, as I was mentioning, and specific feeding strategies. Um, SLPs can consult in the community as well. There are some uh, organizations that offer that. So some signs that a person may be having trouble with swallowing or um, have some changes going on. Um, they could be drooling, they could have a gurgly or wet sounding voice after eating or drinking. And that suggests there could be food or fluid still sitting on the, up on the airway uh, where the voice box is. Pocketing of food in the cheeks, delaying your swallow, coughing or choking during meals. If someone is having reoccurring pneumonia, um, Sometimes they'll pay more attention to, to how someone is swallowing or eating in case they're aspirating food and that's what's causing pneumonia. Um, if they're taking a lot of time or effort to chew, kind of struggling with that process, um, they're having trouble controlling the food in the mouth, um, if people are just struggling to eat enough or having nasal regurgitation. So it's a very intricate process, um, you know, feeding and, and swallowing. There's a whole lot that goes into it and uh, any part of the whole process can be impacted. So just for example, if people need to have, you know, their food changed a little bit to make it safer to, to swallow, moist, soft textures tend to be the easiest to swallow. So some of the, the foods that were on the menu um, included like meatloaf, shepherd's pie, pasta, fish, casserole, stews, and soups. Those soft or moist types of sandwiches such as um, tuna, salmon, or egg. Finally, cut up meat with extra gravy or sauce. So anytime you can add extra sauces or moisteners, it could be ketchup, could be, um, you know, dressings, any of those kinds of things or gravies, um, that's going to help it slide down better. And if people have trouble swallowing fluids, it is recommended to sip from a cup. If you use a straw, it shoots the fluid straight to the back of the throat and it gives people less time to coordinate their swallow. Um, so Okay, so we talked about that one already. I apologize for the duplicate. And um, sometimes people develop a strong preference for sweet food. And I know um, in our culture, there's a lot of fear around sugar, you know, that it's not good for health. Um, but in moderate amounts, you know, it can really help people improve their intake, uh, having sweet foods. Um, and, you know, the, the sugar part, it's, it could be a concern if someone was younger, you know, and uh, had a long life expectancy and a lot of factors. But if someone's in their, their upper years, you know, a sugar intake is usually not going to cause them any trouble. Medications can be adjusted to cover people's blood sugars, for example, if, if they're having diabetes. So um, a little bit of sugar um, can really help improve intake and uh, is nothing to be worried about for, for most people, say, who have more advanced dementia. Um, it's much more important to try to get them eating, um, you know, maintain some intake than it is to worry about the sugar. So you can add a sweet flavor sometimes to nutritious foods, you know, using cinnamon, honey, maple syrup or brown sugar. Um, you can try some of the sweeter breads that are out there, like there's that whole grain cinnamon raisin bread now by Country Harvest or sweetened granola bars only have like a teaspoon of sugar. 
um, yogurt pudding, smooth flavored cottage cheese, chocolate milk, um, things like this um, sometimes can be better accepted than, than other types of foods. So um, it's okay to have some sweet foods in people's diet if it helps them also get uh, the nutrition as well. Okay, and we covered some of those ones before. And okay, I'm not sure why my slides are repeating. This didn't show up on the, the version that I had checked, but um, included in the handout package, there are some flyers for the Ensure and Glucerna Club. Um, so there is special discounts and special offers. Um, so the one of the challenges with using Ensure is that is the cost. So they're about, you know, two something a bottle generally. So if someone's having one or two a day, that can add up over time for finances. And yes, you can make your own smoothies, but um, you can't really beat the um, convenience as well, you know, depending on if you have the time to make your own version or not. So um, if, if you are using it regularly, it is worth signing up for those clubs. The supplements, they have a little bit of dairy in them. That's where the protein part is sourced usually, but they are considered low in lactose. And most people with lactose intolerance can drink and sure that is the you know, official statement from the company. Um, and I generally find most people that I've worked with who have lactose intolerance can drink them. They can be used as a drink with a meal or a snack. So for example, just substituting someone's usual, you know, a drink for something that has nutrition in it. Um, if it fills people up, then it can be had between meals or at snacks. Some people may find, you know, a small percent will find that it, it can bother their stomach. Um, and that can be because, you know, things like Ensure, there's so much in there that it's a fairly concentrated drink. Um, it can be a lot in the digestive system. So if you have smaller amounts at a time or dilute it with ice or another type of drink, uh, that can really help with the tolerance. Uh, if someone doesn't want kind of the milky consistency, Boost Fruit Beverage is a protein and vitamin fortified drink that um, comes in like a juice box that you can pour into another cup. Um, there's a link there to see it online for ordering. Uh, it's called the Clear Fluid Supplement, and it's usually really well tolerated by everybody. Some people will make like sort of an ice cream float, you know, with the Ensure. Uh, people's intake's really low, you know, adding additional protein powder or ice cream can be mixed in as well. And so um, other options, so caregivers can be very busy supporting their loved ones. It can be hard to, you know, be at the stove cooking and things like that. So um, meal supports that are out there include meals on wheels for um, anyone, you know, who's over 65 can get the meals delivered or any type of physical or mental disability. There's no doctor's note needed. It's just self-referral. Um, so the cost varies depending on people's income level. If people are low income, it can be as low as four fifteen for the daily fresh meal, and they've been delivering them. Um, and you, you heat them up yourself now. Uh, it used to be hot meal delivery, um, and now it's heated up yourself during the pandemic. Um, they have a couple of different diet types. So regular, gentle, which is like, for example, for stomach issues or people who have heartburn, um, no added salt, diabetic, or mince texture. You can also get weekly frozen meals delivered. You can change the amount of meals that you get as well. Um, and then there's a lower price for depending on people's income as well. And you have a lot more choices with the frozen options, um, whereas the, the fresh meal delivered daily, they have usually just the one option per diet type. Heart to Home Meals is a, a private company that has started up in the last few years. It's an online frozen meal delivery and they deliver free across Ontario. They have options for all meals, soups and desserts. They have a number of specialty diets. Their meals are designed with input by a dietitian to be well balanced for nutrition. The cost is definitely a, a barrier for some people or consideration, but um, they may be something that people can afford for, you know, to have here and there uh, to help top up eating at home. Uh, so it says the um, meals, they range from eight to $11 and they have their meal catalogs online. After you place your first order, they will start sending you their catalogs as well. They do update what they have from time to time. Usually seasonally, there's a new catalog, spring, summer and fall, winter. So we're now on to the final um, part of the presentation, which is a case study. It has been submitted by one of you wonderful caregivers, and I thought it was such a great example of a lot of the challenges that people can face as their dementia is progressing uh, with their eating. So thank you so much for sharing this and for your permission for us to discuss it as a group today. So I'm just going to read it out and then I'll share a few ideas and I hope in the discussion that we can all brainstorm some more. I was wondering how to increase the variety of foods with my mom. She says she won't eat beef or pork. 
Maybe with her dementia, she won't know it's beef. Her hemoglobin and iron levels are low since her hospitalization. We hope to increase the weight. She came home at 78 pounds. She is on Ensure, but it seems to be mostly sugars. Doctors want her to gain weight. Her dinner has been mostly one pot cooking with carbs, veggies, and protein that my sister prepares and freezes in meal proportions. This was the way she was eating even before needing care, so we kept it familiar. She's 94 and has upper and lower dentures. She's in Toronto. When I last visited, I made a bunch of soups with table cream, saute onions, and butter. What foods stimulate appetite? I suggest that the PSWs leave food on the table during the day so she sees it and eats it. She doesn't like any food left out. She would store her crackers and cookies in the fridge if there was room, lol. Suggest that she graze during the day. Since her return from hospital, her dementia has progressed and often she says she's not hungry, doesn't think of it. She will say she can't eat anymore. So there's a lot of different points here to consider. Um, so the family and the PSWs are, are doing a lot of the things that we've already been brainstorming on, you know, offering food regularly, offering familiar comforting foods, um, you know, having things prepared in advance and frozen in meal proportions so it's ready to go whenever she is up for eating, you know, adding extra higher calorie things uh, through the ensures and the table cream, onions and butter. Like these are all great strategies. Um, it's, it's really, um, a really tough thing for families when they see their loved one lose a lot of weight and, and really drop their intake. So I just want to validate the challenges, you know, that you can hear, you know, you can hear the love and the, the care that is in this letter here. Um, so even with the best effort, sometimes you can't prevent weight loss, but you may be able to slow it down. Um, and sometimes you can help people regain, regain some weight, but it is highly individual. Um, so the ensure, as we were saying, you know, there's more benefits in this type of situation when people have lost a lot of weight and their intake is becoming low, um, then there is worry about the sugar. So uh, I would keep that going, you know, one or two a day or whatever she's managing to take in uh, as, a, as a fluid option, you know, Know, over some of the lower nutrition fluids um, it helps with hydration as well if it's a preferred fluid uh, and then in terms of the meal so um, certainly that sounds like a well-balanced meal you know like carbs veggies and protein uh, if she's still eating at least one solid meal a day that, that does go a long way compared to you know if, if you're down to very little solid food um, I, I like the idea of offering her food throughout the day um, but as, as the family members saying you know that uh, she um you know, she doesn't want to see her food sitting out. So it may be a matter of taking it out of the fridge, you know, offering it to her and putting it back in the fridge, um, kind of at planned times throughout the day uh, and trying to find a window where she might be up for eating. I just want to mention in terms of the iron, because um, that was an, in the top of the question. So it is true that beef has twice the iron of like pork or chicken or fish. So it has about two milligrams of iron compared to one milligram of iron for the other choices. But the other choices do matter too. Um, older adults need around eight milligrams of iron a day. So it could come from a number of sources. Uh, people don't have to eat beef to, to do that. Um, if, if she would be willing to eat eggs, for example, um, those, that's also a source of the higher quality iron. The plant-based iron isn't absorbed as well uh, from the vegetable sources, but um, you can do searches online and take a look at, you know, the list of iron content in foods, or I can send that out to the group as well, um, just to see if there's any foods. Now, the Ensure will have some of it in there. Each bottle of Ensure is designed to have 25% of vitamin and mineral requirements because um, it is designed to be a meal replacement. So that'll be helping with the iron intake as well well. Um, sometimes doctors will prescribe iron supplements, as we were saying, especially when the intake from the diet is, is not, um, you know, being achieved. So uh, it can be hard to get people to take things if they already have a pill burden, you know, a lot of stuff to take, and you're, you're trying to crush it and mix it into, you know, sometimes applesauce or ice cream or things. But uh, sometimes people can take the supplements as well if the doctor wants people to try that. Um, so there's, there's a lot of challenging things, you know, but I just want to say, you know, this family sounds like they're really trying their best, uh, you know, and, and that it has been stressful and things in terms of what food stimulate appetite. It's really, you know, about whatever, you know, <laughs> might cue the person that they feel like eating, for example, cooking some of their favorites, if you're um, at home with them and, you know, see if the smell kind of stimulates their appetite. 
Um, you know, some foods smell really great while they're cooking and that can be appealing. And, you know, just trying to go back to comfort foods that the person used to enjoy and, and see if anything resonates with them. Um, you know, it's just small amounts kind of throughout the day and, uh, and try to kind of do what you can. Um, but if, but uh, if, as the condition progresses, it is normal for people to eat less. Um, so you can only do what you can do. So I get that this is hard, but I just I just want to offer empathy and, uh, you know, hopefully the group can have some other suggestions for this caregiver as well. So in conclusion, nutrition needs change for older adults, but it remains an important part of health and well-being. Dimension can change people's eating habits significant ways, but it's usually still an enjoyable part of life, although intake may typically fluctuate and decline over time. If people are able to take an age and gender specific multivitamin that contains the vitamin D and the B vitamins, or you can take these separately as vitamin D and say B12, Quality of life, safety, and enjoyment are always key, um, even over nutrition. Um, and caregivers, where possible, are encouraged to take care of themselves. Kind of got to care for the caregiver first, right? Uh, with healthy eating to help keep up your strength and energy for all the important and vital work that you're doing. So I've listed a few of the references that I've used um, that will have summaries of some of the content of the presentation. If anyone is interested in reading more about foods, um, helping to preserve or slow down brain changes, these are some of my favorite books on the topic. Anyone wants to read more about Mediterranean diet or whole grains um, or have some recipes or inspiration, there's just a few websites listed. And I have my email here. I just want to let everybody know if anyone ever thinks of a question that they would like to shoot my way, uh, please feel free. I always love to hear from people. Uh, I would be happy to respond anytime. You can also call a dietitian here in Ontario through telehealth. Um, so when you first call telehealth, they'll ask you who you want to speak to and you can say a dietitian and they'll put you three to one. You can also get some more information and resources that way. And that is the end. So I am ready for questions now. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Christina. That was a really great presentation and a whole lot of information uh, jam packed into that. Um, before we hop into the questions, I just wanted to quickly say um, just to everyone that uh, Christina has graciously agreed to share um, a PDF version of her PowerPoint slides that she shared with us tonight. Um, as well as you might have heard her reference, um, a, a resource package as well. So I just wanted to assure everyone that we're going to share um, the slides and the resource packages um, with everyone who's attended uh, via email. Um, I would probably say tomorrow we will do that. We'll send it out. Um, so you guys will have access to all those resources. There's, um, there's quite a few of them and they're really great. So uh, thanks, Christina, for doing that for us as well. Um, and we also do hope to put the recording of the webinar and those those resources on our website as well. So that will be another great um, place to access them. So it looks like we have a couple of questions here um, in the Q&A and uh, we encourage people if you have any other thoughts or questions, um, you can certainly put them in there. Um, also, perhaps if anyone had any, any thoughts or comments on the, uh, the case study, we can also put that maybe um, in the chat or the Q&A um, box, just if anyone had any suggestions or thoughts. Um, but we will let maybe Catherine uh, jump into the first couple of questions here and see where we get. Okay, I'm wondering, Christina, do you wanna stop sharing your screen for now mm -hmm. um, so we can see you a little better? Mm -hmm. um, so the first question, I'm not sure if this one was answered with your slide with all those adaptive assistive device, assisted devices, um, uh, but the question is, if a person with dementia has a tremor in their dominant hand, do you mm -hmm. have any tips for making eating easier and avoiding spills and embarrassment? Yes, yes. So I have worked with a number of people who have had that challenge. And sometimes the weighted cutlery can help with more security and self feeding. Um, sometimes we would put like soup into a cup so that it would have the higher sign and if they could sip from it versus trying to get a spoonful of liquid up to your mouth if your hand isn't stable is, is quite a challenge. Um, and sometimes we would just uh, reduce like the foods they were receiving that were messy or sloppy, that would be, you know, more of an embarrassment or difficult 
difficult to manage. Um, I had one client say that he preferred sandwiches at both because it was just the easiest to feed himself and he didn't have to worry about, about spilling anything. Uh, sometimes having those plates that have the higher edges on them um, can be helpful as well, more of an edge to, to get a better grip on the food. Um, so there, there could be a number of things like that. Uh, and some people did really like the weighted cutlery. It helps to um, resist the tremor motion, um, give more stability. So it may be worth talking to an occupational therapist for that idea. And then the lidded cup, as I was saying, can really help, um, you know, nobody wants to have their drinks spill in them, you know, and then they don't get to drink it and it's embarrassing or, or difficult, you know, have to clean up and things. So um, there are a lot of adult cups that do have the lids on them um, that can, can help to solve that issue. So. Thank you. Next question is about omega-3 oils, those wonderful yeah. fatty acids that we all need. Would omega-3 be best from fish? And this person is interested in, in alternatives for vegans. Yes, yes. So the marine source omega-3 has the best evidence for sure, but now vegans have an option with the LJ source, um, which has the same type of DHA and EPA in it, uh, rather than the, the more vegetarian ALA, which is from walnuts and things like that. So it's recommended for vegans to take the LJ1 to get that higher quality omega-3, which is better absorbed, quite a bit better than the, the um, ALA source that is found in the vegetarian foods. So it is recommended to take that one if you're vegan uh, and it is a vegan compliant omega-3. Um, and I'll just say for the supplements as well, you want to avoid the three, six, nine blends because we already get enough six and nine from our diets generally. You want just a, a pure omega-3. Um, there, you know, in terms of the krill oil, those are supposed to be a little bit better absorbed, but probably not worth the price difference. Um, if you look for one that's specialized for mental health or brain health, it's going to be going to have that nice ratio that's being shown in the studies to, to help support brain health. So that is something that I suggest people look for. You'll see some advertising different benefits on them, and the ones for brain or mood health are going to be in the more optimal ratio of the two types of yeah, omega-3. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks, Christina. Uh, and the last question so far is um, this person would like to know your thoughts on regular yogurt versus yogurt with less sugar. Yeah, so it really all depends on what people enjoy and what people are used to. Um, you know, it's a pretty different taste with the you know, there's the no added sugar that have the sweetener in them that'll still taste sweet. And then there's ones that are just completely plain, which are a little bit more tangy or bitter. Although if you, you know, mix in fruit or jam or things like that, you can sweeten them up. So if people like the lower sugar version, you know, um, that's fine. But the regular versions just generally have about one teaspoon or slightly over that of sugar. Um, it, either way you look at it, it is a very healthy, great choice to have. So I usually tell people to pick what they enjoy if they do like the lower sugar then certainly you know you can have that if you don't want the sugar but there's nothing harmful about having one teaspoon of sugar for example in a healthy food like a yogurt um, so uh, there's so many products on the market I think that I've read there's over like 300 choices in the yogurt aisle now you know so people can just experiment and have a mix of them for variety and uh, you don't have to feel that you can only have one kind um, for example you can mix it up with some Greek yogurt for the protein maybe have some Activia for the probiotics so you can have different different brands and have some fun with it you know it doesn't have to be just uh, just low fat or, or low sugar uh, although there's certainly nothing wrong with those ones too mm -hmm. that's great a couple more questions have come in oh this is a good one is olive oil the best to cook with right so olive oil has the most well-proven benefits, I think, in terms of heart health, but it's not the best to fry with. It doesn't have a really high smoke point. Um, sometimes people will mix it with one of the lower smoke point oils, such as canola, if you're frying with it, and that'll help prevent it from burning. Um, you can use it as a finishing oil on things so that it won't be getting affected by the heat, because um, it can get a bit damaged as well if being used at a high heat. Um, and also there's there's other um, oils like avocado oil has really good health benefits and it's got a higher smoke point for frying in, but it's it's twice the cost of canola. Most people can't afford that. So I usually suggest to people like um, definitely you can use olive oil, um, like I said, as finishing oil mixed with other oils. Um, you can mix even a bit of butter with it will, will help it to cook better generally. Um, but it's not the best as on its own just for pure out frying. So um, canola oil is a good mix 
mixing oil with it that doesn't have too bad of a ratio for the omega-3, like the types of fats that it has. Um, and it's a whole lot cheaper too. Um, a couple more tips for olive oil is if you want the really top quality um, in terms of the antioxidant content, they do recommend buying it from the people that are like sourcing it more directly. So we're lucky in London to have several um, local olive oil stores that source the best stuff. So all of me and there's like, several other ones as well that, that you can, um, um, most of them have online delivery now too, which is great. So the good thing with that is it hasn't been sitting there for years, which we don't know with the grocery store versions. They say sometimes they've been sitting there a long time and the health value of olive oil goes down the longer it sits. So um, get it going from more of the small batch sellers. If you have the money, uh, then for sure you're going to get more uh, of the benefits. You'll notice the ones from those stores are more of a peppery taste. And that's another sign that it's really fresh and vibrant. Um, it's kind of more of like a, a dull taste in the ones in the store. Not that they're not worth buying, but if you want the top notch ones, it's uh, and you have the funds, it's just worth paying a little more. That's great. This is a good question. So um, you mentioned omega oils. Um, mm -hmm. Is there something a person can take if they are allergic to both fish and nut nuts, specifically peanuts? Right. Um, I, th I think the algae is still is something that you could take um, for people with fish allergies. I, I'll, I'll have to double check that one, though. I'm not sure, not confident on that one. I better double check that. Um, I can get back to you on that one. It gets tricky with the allergies. Yeah, if there's a seafood and, and nut allergy. Um, but there are other sources of omega-3 um, that should be on one of those links that was in the presentation outside of those sources um, for food source. Um, so the eggs, for example, that have the omega-3 in them, they actually have a pretty decent amount compared to the eggs that don't have that. So basically the omega-3 eggs are from hens being fed a flaxseed uh, enhanced diet, and then they naturally produce those, the high quality omega-3 in the eggs. So that could be another way to get a good source um, if you can't have seed food or nuts. Uh, and then there was other sources as well that should be on those handouts. Uh, but I, I'm not, not confident about the supplement version if that would be okay to have. Mm -hmm. So are the omega-3s, is that yeah. it flax, is flaxseed high in omega-3s specifically? It's, it's a source of the vegetarian ALA, but in the chicken's bodies, they actually convert it to the more beneficial EPA and DHA. Oh, how so, nice of them. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, a uh, couple more questions. My spouse was on supplements zinc, D3, omega-3, and since being in long-term care, he is not. What would be a polite way to ask that he takes those supplements? He's in a secured area and certainly wouldn't get enough D3. Yeah, so I, I think most facilities should be very open to D3 because the falls prevention data is so strong in that area. Um, I know in our setting, all of our, like our two geriatric units, everybody automatically got the thousand. Like our doctors were, were firmly convinced on that. So that one, and it's also a very small pill. So um, that one is easier for people to take. Um, as I know often they cut the supplements to reduce the pill burden um, because they want people to focus on the ones that are maybe, you know, that are gonna be the most impactful for, for how they're doing day to day, uh, sort of the most vital ones. Um, but I do still believe that there is value in taking these other supplements, but it's a matter of, you know, really talking to the nurse and doctor and saying, you know, like, how, how is my loved one doing with taking pills? Is it a challenging thing? And, you know, or would they be able to manage taking a little bit extra? Um, it's just a bit of extra work if they're crushing them, for example, you know, to put a few more, you know, into whatever they're mixing or um, but if they say like, you know, it's already a struggle to get the person to take them, you know, so that's why we cut the supplements. I would suggest just maybe trying to advocate for the vitamin D at that point, because it is a very tiny pill. Um, so it shouldn't be too much of a burden to add that one back in. Zinc can be like, it's a bigger supplement pill generally because the minerals are kind of bulky. So they, they might not, you know, want to try to, to have him take that. But um, it's always worth having the conversation and saying it's something, you know, that I think, you know, could benefit them. Uh, is there a potential that they could take it? So, and just see what they say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm just gonna jump in quickly. Christina, would it be fair to say, I, I'm not sure if you would know, would all long-term care homes have a registered dietitian on staff? 
Yes, it's mandatory. Okay. Yes. So, and um, so typically the dietitians see, um, I did a brief work in, in uh, long-term care before starting at Parkwood, and typically the dietitians see all the residents that have been rated as high nutritional risk on a regular basis, at least quarterly. Um, so every three months, there should be an assessment happening by, for the high risk um, residents. And then usually the, the manager or supervisor is, is doing the quarterlies on all the, the moderate to low risk. And then there can be referrals for any resident at any time with any type of issue that pops up. So family members can absolutely request a dietitian assessment at any time. Um, I used to get a number of referrals all the time for, it could be for weight loss, for, for new chewing or swallowing issues, um, you know, increasing fiber. Um, person needs their like specialty diet adjusted, you know, gluten-free or or whatever vegetarian, whatever people need, um, you know, definitely the dietitians can be pulled in for any resident. They don't have to be at a high overall nutrition risk to, to have involvement. Yeah, that's great. One last question at this point: um, Does ghee have a high smoke point? Yes, yes, it does. Yes, that one is good for frying with. So yes, that, that, that's safe to fry with. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Those are all the questions at this point. I'll just jump in quickly with a comment that I um, thought of just during the presentation. Um, you were mentioning a little bit about um, SLP, so speech language pathologists, um, doing assessments in the community. So I just wanted to say um, for any folks who are connected to home and community care and have a care coordinator, um, they offer um, SLP services in the community. So if you were interested um, in having an assessment, I would encourage you to talk to your care coordinator and, and they could see about um, having a, an SLP uh, referral made um, on, your, on your person's behalf. And then that's a good link to, to potentially those. They might even know a little bit about those accessible utensils and stuff and yeah. OTs are good for that. And the same thing, um, OTs in the community through home and community care could also be um, a good resource for those, uh, for the adaptive equipment. Right, it's looking like I'm not seeing any other questions. So I'll put out, I'll put out maybe a last call um, for questions there. And then um, like Christina said, she has graciously shared her, her email address. Um, so if anyone does think of, mm -hmm. of any questions um, and, and feel free to contact her or, or one of us here at McCormick and we'd be happy to uh, reach out to her on your behalf as well. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention is there's a couple of folks um, that we haven't been able to account for um, just on our attendance. So I was just wondering um, if uh, you could just check your chat, we've reached out to the people who we weren't sure um, maybe what your last name is, or if you had, um, you know, like a phone number or something as your, your name. So if you could just check your chat boxes and, and just reply with your name, that would help us um, for taking attendance for tonight. Um, okay, well, other than that, um, I just wanted to thank you, Christina so much for for spending time with us um you know this evening and on behalf of mccormick dementia services and all the attendees um, we're just really thankful that you were able to come and, and speak with us tonight uh like i mentioned earlier we're recording this and we'll have it posted um hopefully on our website in the near future so that uh, you guys can refer back to it or share it with anyone who you think might benefit from it um, and again the resource package will likely be going out um, by email hopefully tomorrow and we'll also try and include that um, on our website as well, which is really awesome. And the last thing I wanted to say is um, this was, you know, part one of, of a three part webinar series that we are doing. So part two is next week on Wednesday, the 15th. We have uh, Shauna Versloot, who is a chef from the community, and she'll be joining us to demonstrate some cooking and uh, she'll be sharing culinary tips, tricks and valuable knowledge. Uh, we will also be entering all of those who attend into a giveaway to win a copy of her cookbook called uh, the Live Well Col uh, Collection, which I actually own myself. It's really great. So that's exciting. We're happy that we're, we're able to give, uh, give that out to someone. And lastly, I just wanted to extend a thank you to all of the participants who joined us tonight. Uh, we hope that you were able to find some helpful information or tips uh, throughout the presentation. And we hope that you guys all join us next week as well. I think that's good. Oh, I see a comment. Will we get the recipes before next Wednesday? So I'm, I'm thinking that you're um, referring to the webinar next week. 
Um, so yes, I'm uh, just waiting to get them uh, back from Shauna. So she'll be providing us um, some ingredient lists. So she's doing a rotisserie chicken. It's kind of cool. She's using rotisserie chicken and she's showing us, I think it's three different meals uh, for two people out of the rotisserie chicken. So she'll send the ingredient lists for um, all three of the meals. She encouraged people to just maybe make one of them, um, but I will definitely share those out via email as soon as I receive them from her. Other than that, I think we will uh, we will wrap it up. I'm seeing a couple of thank yous um, in the comments and questions as well, Christina. So uh, just again, thank you very much. And uh, we hope in, everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Okay, take care. Thank you, everyone. Take care. <laughs>